This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mises Weekends. We are in the midst of our annual Austrian Economics Research Conference. So our show this weekend features a talk delivered today on day one of that conference by our good friend, the libertarian muckraking journalist, Jim Bovard, who is someone I'm sure many of you know. I've known him for many, many years since I lived in Washington, D.C. You may know his name from publications like The Wall Street Journal, The Hill, USA Today. He gave a great talk today on the follies of Washington, D.C., especially the regulatory regime, uh, things like uh, the FDA, farm subsidies, and why steel tariffs, for example, just don't work. So it's a rollicking speech, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy about the next 25 minutes with the great Jim Bovard. It's interesting the things I've investigated over the years, it's often fascinated me to see that the government policies are far more wasteful and irrational and often more oppressive than they're, than they're widely perceived. Um, uh, 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 one example on that is uh, agriculture programs. Um, I've, I've been sniping, at, uh, sniping in D.C. at federal agencies for a couple years before I went out to pick up the Washington Post one morning in early 1983 and saw a headlight announcing that the feds would be shutting down 78 million acres of farmland that year. And this was a mystery because everybody knew Ronald Reagan was a champion of free enterprise. And here he's going to shut down all this farmland. Um, now, keep in mind, federal farm programs had been started 50 years early because of market failure. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, back when, when FDR's brain trust decided that you, there was something intrinsic in markets that prevented them from working, and the, the evidence that they didn't work was that prices weren't high enough. The high, the crop prices weren't high enough, and so what FDR did was basically make a farm dictator and invest all this arbitrary power in the USDA sector, uh, the Secretary of Agriculture, and that was supposed to fix things. Um, it didn't fix things, but they kept doing it every year for 50 years. By early 1983, the programs were a train wreck. Uh, in 1981, Congress had passed a uh, four-year farm bill to govern agriculture. Now, uh, Stalin had his five-year plans for the steel industry. Why not have a four-year plan for American agriculture? But Congress made uh, a couple details wrong. For instance, it assumed inflation would keep roaring along, and, that, and so price price supports for each crop would, were scheduled to rise a lot each year. Well, inflation slowed almost faster than almost anybody but Ron Paul and maybe Lou Rockwell expected. And all of a sudden, by late 1982, you had the biggest US government crop surpluses in history, US government grain surpluses. You had uh, the uh, farm program costs were doubling, and exports were collapsing because Congress and USC had priced US crops out of world markets. So the obvious answer was to shut down the farms. Well, it, it was obvious in Washington. Uh, so the, uh, the Reagan people launched the Payment in Kind program uh, to counteract the boneheaded signals by other farm programs. This program gave farmers $25 billion worth of surplus crops in addition to $50 billion worth of other uh, federal benefits. These are converted to current dollars. Now, 78 million acres, that's more than double the entire land mass of Alabama. This is more, th more than shutting down the entire states of Ohio and Indiana. This is how badly the federal farm policy had failed. I mean, it was astounding. And yet, according to Agriculture Secretary John Block, he said that, this, that PIC was the most successful farm program in history. <laughs> you know, it was fascinating to see stuff like that. And, Nobody in D.C. paid attention to the victims of this government intervention because you had, you had the government shutting down all, all this cropland. And what that did was wipe out a quarter million jobs at a time when the nation was still recovering from the worst recession since World War II. It, had, it, it, it was devastating. Uh, hundreds of fertilizer and seed dealers had to close up shop because Pitt cut their sales by uh, you know, 50%. And you had the cutback in harvest and a, a, a drought devastated, bankrupted a lot of uh, unsubsidized poultry, cattle, and pork producers. Because, okay, the government drives, drives up feed grain, uh, feed grain prices. What could possibly go wrong? I mean, this is the attitude in D.C. on ethanol because, 
I mean, the, the, the ethanol policy completely screws the pork and cattle industry and the poultry industry. So, but anyhow, so I, was, I got an assignment to write about this pick program for Reader's Digest and got an interview with uh, John Block. And uh, Block was, he seemed like a nice guy. He was a West Point graduate, hog farmer. Block had once described himself as uh, just a country boy on loan to the Department of Agriculture. Uh, I thought about starting the interview by telling him I was a country boy on loan to Reader's Digest. But I said, no, nah, I don't need to use that joke. So um, good thing I didn't. Um, Block was a nice guy, and he was just and he was using the general vague talking points. I said, "Well, how come the feds are shutting down so many acres?" He said, "Well, it's important not to starve farmers off the land." Apparently, in contrast to the farm workers who were put out of work, um, and, uh, a pick, uh, Block said that the program was necessary so the government could move to a, a more market-oriented agriculture policy. This is, this is a line that has been echoing for many decades in D.C. Uh, so I asked, so, so how come Reagan signed a bill, you know, in late 1982, boosting the crop price supports even higher after it was obvious the, the program was all screwed up? And uh, Block was puzzled and uh, said that there was, uh, there was no such bill. President Reagan didn't do that. And, uh, you know, sitting next to him on his right hand was, was his portly press secretary, who at that point kind of squirmed as if someone had just broken wind. And he uh, leans towards Block. He says, uh, I think he's referring to the provisions of last September's Omnib Omnibus Bu Budget Reconciliation Act. Block's written, yeah, OK. And I paused, and I was expecting an answer. And can we explain this? And nothing. But you know, maybe it's possible that Block was appointed to that job because he didn't understand the contradictions. I mean, there were some people in the USDA who did, and they were like, oh, what are we doing, but not block. So this, uh, 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 this program didn't make any sense, but instead of being a monstrosity, it became a prototype. And so um, almost every year in the 1980s, USDA was paying farmers to shut down 70 million acres or more. And mind you, farming is an export industry. And so you shut down the markets here. It's like subsidizing the farmers in Argentina and France. But you know, it, 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 was easier, it was easier for the politicians to shut down American agriculture than to untangle self-defeating farm policies. But, you know, OK, so from the start of Reagan's time to 1995, consumers and taxpayers spent so much on farm subsidies that for the same amount, the government could have bought all the farmland in 41 states. That was the level of subsidies. And of course, you know, that was unsustainable. It had to change. So in 1996, the, the, the GOP had taken over Congress and uh, the, part of the Gingrich Revolution. They uh, pushed through the Freedom to Farm Act. And what that did was end federal farm subsidies handouts to farmers. Well, it didn't exactly end them. It changed them to market transition payments. And then the market transition payments worked out really well, so they perpetuated them. And in order to make uh, farmers happy with the Freedom of Farm Act, the level of subsidies was three times higher than what it had been under the previous farm programs. But, you know, it was, it was a nice title. I mean, it sounded good. It, you know, it was able to snow some editorial writers, who, who I will not name. Um, but so... It's interesting, people say, uh, does Washington ever get anything right? And well, let's talk about trade. Trade is, a policy, trade is an area where you would think that the government would be, that it's so obvious that trade barriers are foolish. Um, you would think some more on that. I, I, I was doing a lot of trade writing back at the, uh, at the end of the Reagan era, from there to the Clinton era, and uh, Pat Buchanan was pushing the protectionist line back then. Uh, a lot of the Democrats were gung ho on that. President George H. W. Bush was doing and a lot of doing and saying a lot of stupid things. A lot of the writing on trade back then had more heat than light. There were uh, there were lots of folks who were shouting about the benefits of free trade, but very few were exposing the actual grisly details of how the federal government created trade barriers. Now, there's a wonderful line from uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said that a writer should put an argument into a concrete shape, into an image, some hard phrase, solid as a ball, which people can carry home with them. 
And that was what I aspired to do when I wrote about trade policy and a lot of other areas. So I, I got out my calculator and tried to translate some of these vague federal restrictions on trade into um, vivid imagery. And for instance, the, we had a lot of import quotas on, uh, for farm stuff. And at that point, the quotas permitted each American citizen to consume the equivalent of one teaspoon of foreign ice cream per year, one pound of imported cheese, and two foreign peanuts per year. These were very strict quotas, very, very strict. On, on textiles, they were even more stringent. They had, um, uh, they had 3,000 different quotas, including quotas on tampons, tarps, twine, towels, and ties. And a lot of these, a lot of these uh, quotas dictate exactly how much a foreign country could sell to American consumers. For instance, in, in 1989, Mexico was allowed to ship to the U.S. only 35,292 bras, which was not even enough to cup the city of Brownsville, Texas. <laughs> but, but, the, uh, but the biggest issue back then was dumping. I mean, this is an issue that Trump is picking up now. And dumping supposedly meant that the uh, foreigners were acting in a predatory manner. You had, um, you had a lot of allegations that Japanese were trying to take over. Um, and in the, but in the formal definition, dumping simply says foreign companies are selling, good here, selling their goods here for less than fair value uh, at an unfair price. Uh, it means less than their, in the ho a lower price here than in their home market or less than the cost of production. And Commerce Department was running this, and they were able to convict 97% of all foreign companies of dumping who they investigated. So you would think that you know, there was so much cheating and conspiring going on abroad, but that's not quite how it worked out. So keep in mind, this is a fair trade law, and let's, let's see how the Commerce Department found foreigners guilty. For instance, the uh, Commerce nailed Japanese uh, forklift producers for dumping after it compared the price of brand new forklifts in Japan with the price of three-year-old forklifts in the US. The, uh, the same thing happened with Mazda when Mazda convicted, uh, Mazda was convicted for the selling new vans in Japan um, uh, for uh, compared to the price of new vans there with used vans here. Um, it gets better. In a flower dumping case, this is one of my favorite examples, Commerce compared the price of wilted flowers in New York City with the price of fresh flowers in Amsterdam. Since the wilted, uh, since the wilted flowers sold for less, uh, the uh, Dutch were scoundrels. Uh, foreigners also got nailed because commerce would compare um, wholesale prices and retail prices. Uh, for Swedish steel, commerce compared um, a mark home, uh, Swedish steel sales are less than 500 kilograms with U.S. sales of more than 5,000, with more than 5,000 kilograms. The, um, the, um, it was a, a higher price for the, small, uh, for the large quantities uh, uh, for the small quantities, so that proved that the Swedes were cheating. Um, what, another favorite example is uh, commerce would penalize any company that appeared to be failing to charge American consumers the highest prices in the world. I mean, this is, uh, this is actually in their regulations. This is how, uh, how dumping is defined. Uh, it's, it, uh, it's, it's being unfair to the American Businesses, basically. There was a case in which commerce con uh, convicted farmers, uh, the farmers in New Zealand, who were growing kiwis, and what commerce did was compare the price of small kiwis from New Zealand sold to the U.S. with the price of larger kiwis from New, Z New Zealand sold to Japan. Uh, since, the, uh, since the small kiwis cost less than the large ones, New Zealand was guilty. I mean, these are things that don't make any sense, but this is what drives trade policy. And most of the journalists don't understand how these laws work. Uh, journalists usually don't have a lot of intellectual curiosity. Um, and that's part of the reason why the federal agencies can you know, pull off one PR scam after another. But the, you know, looking at things like dumping and the import quotas, it's a good example of, why, of how the government cannot make trade more fair, uh, more fair by making it less free. Um, another topic of trade policy, 20 years ago I was doing a debate on trade policy in St. Louis sponsored by a group known as the Discussion Club, which had great neckties, not as nice as the Mises, 
But so the, the, now the audience in St. Louis, very conservative, they were hostile. They were hostile, and I didn't make many converts that night. And um, I, you know, I started out my usual litany. You know, I talked. You know, I talked about you know peanuts, ice cream, bras, dumping. And the uh, the first question from the audience, a guy gets up really ornery. He says, "This debate was supposed to be about free trade versus protection. How come you didn't say nothing about tariffs?" <laughs> and I'm thinking, eh. You know, you got all these trade barriers. I said, okay, all right, I'll talk about tariffs. Hecklers. So tariffs have always struck me as so self-evidently idiotic. And you see how they're set and, and, and the strings that are pulled. I mean, you know, tariffs are, the, uh, the, uh, the case against tariffs, it's so obvious that even Trump would, well, actually, maybe not. <laughs> So I was writing a book about trade policy a couple decades ago, and, um, and when I was doing that, I dove into the two volumes of the U.S. Tariff Code. And it was, um, you know, they had 8,753 different taxes on imports. And each tax was very wise and omniscient. But, you know, the, 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 the average American tax at the tariff at that point was about 5%, but a lot of them were in the stratosphere. And b back then, congressmen kept saying that the U.S. has victimized by its free trade policy. And my attitude was, look at the tariff code. So, and a lot of these tariffs were class warfare, looked at like that at its worst. Mink furs were duty free, but polyester sweaters for babies were tariffed at 40%. Lobster was duty free, orange juice was 40%. If you were having, if you were importing fancy French water, it was the uh, Perrier, less than 1% tariff. A tariff on cheap shoes, 67%. These are devastating for poor people. Worst of all, cheap cigars were hit by a tariff three times as high as fancy cigars. I mean, this is an anti-redneck bias in the tariff code. <laughs> so a lot of these tariffs you know, were nasty and uh, some prohibitive, but my hunch was there were a lot higher rates hidden in that tariff code because many of the tariffs were based not on price or percentage, but on the weight or the count of a product. And so that makes it a lot more difficult to expose um, what the government's up to. It's, I mean, it's, it's hard to get people excited about a, a tariff of 17.4 cents per kilogram. You know, people aren't going to the barricades for that. So, so as a researcher, I contacted a number of federal agencies seeking to find out, okay, What's the percentage tariff on these items, these items that are kind of uh, are cryptic? I was told again and again that information did not exist. You know, nobody has it. Anyhow, so a few months later, I was taking a break from the book. I was traveling around Europe. I had a Eurail pass. And uh, one of the places I stopped for tax write-off purposes uh, was in Geneva, Switzerland, at the headquarters of the General Agreement for Tra Trade and Tariffs. Now, GATT headquarters back then, it was right close to the Lake, Lake Geneva, and it, 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 was, it looked like a mix between a fortress and a castle for international bureaucrats. Um, I, as, and I, uh, as I was entering, they had, they had security as tight, if not worse, than TSA. I was double searched. They were, I, I had my uh, bike courier bag, which they opened up and checked through, and just practically everything. I, I felt like a client like a lawyer going to visit a client on death row. Um, I had an appointment that morning for some honchos who were running the uh, textile import quotas office. And their office was at the far end of a, a very long building. It, it seemed like it was long as a football field. So I went there, had a nice chat with those guys. As I was leaving, I was walking down that endless hallway. I saw this rickety card table. It was sitting there, and it was stacked high with really thick documents. And I got a little closer. I noticed that the door next to the table was labeled tariff negotiations. And, and those big, thick documents, they were titled U.S. Proposal for Market Access Negotiations. Now, it would have been unseemly to stop and peruse a U.S. government docu a document with a big stamp of secret on the top of it. But, you know, I was thinking, you know, there were like 20 copies on that table. I mean... These were extras, right? I mean, <laughs> these were heading to recycling, baby, right? So, you know, I kept walking, but I slowed down a little bit. And I just kind of like, you know, it was almost a mystery. One of those documents practically tossed itself into my uh, courier bag. 
as I moseyed on down that hall. 700 pages, that shit was heavy. So anyhow, <laughs> but I was wondering, I was wondering if the guards would search me on the way out like they did on the way in because so that, that was confidential information. It might have been covered by national security type stuff because of trade negotiations. And if so, it might have been a really interesting conversation. So, but I was, um, I was walking up to the guard desk and I you know, said something to them in garbled German or even worse French. The uh, guards are used to, used to Americans butchering all the languages in Switzerland, so they just kind of waved me on. And I was heading back to the hotel. And I, I opened up that document, and it was clear that it was the, the uh, uh, Rosetta Stone for U.S. protectionism because it had all the numbers. It had all the numbers I was looking at. It was like, oh, my goodness. So, uh, but but I, was, I was concerned that someone at GATT might have noticed me taking a loaner copy. And, so, uh, and since the GATT folks knew where I was staying, uh, you know, I had phoned them uh, from the hotel to arrange the interview. So I got back to the hotel room, and I, uh, you know, my uh, wife, my then wife, was sitting there, puffing nervously on a uh, Marlboro. And I said, "We're leaving the country right now. I'll explain at the train station." And she says, "Ach du lieber Himmel!" So, was it just a gist of her response? Actually, it was a little more profane than that, but it was, you know, it was it was not a surprise that my Frau was always kind of jumpy when she and I traveled together after that. But uh, part of the benefit of your rail passes, if you've ever had them, is you show up at the train station, you flash the pass, you jump on a train, which is what we did. So um, once I got back to DC, I uh, called the chief tariff official at the US Trade Representative's office. The, I, I never met this lady in person. I only knew her as uh, someone, as a telephone, telephone voice who always sound peeved when I called because I'd been writing about this stuff. And uh, so I, you know, I get her on the line, and I, and I says, I need to confirm some data on US tariffs. Huh, she replied. OK, for tariff code 9108, tariff code line 9108, 9120, low price watches, the tariff's 151%, right? I paused. She said nothing. Oh, I, say, I says, for tariff code 2401360, see, that's tobacco stamps, that tariff is almost 500%, right? And then she says, where did you get those numbers? Uh, so I said, uh, from the US government's March 15th GATT proposal. And she says, that's confidential information. And, and I said, I reckon the word secret is stamped on every page. <laughs> <laughs> the word secret is on every page, but I still have to confirm it. You know? And you know, the, the, the sad thing is, she slammed down the phone before I could tell her, have a nice day. <laughs> but it was great to have those numbers because it helped me hammer US trade policy to hammer the hypocrisy and the frauds and, and the outrages that have been going on. And you know, some people criticized me for you know, taking the document, but it was a US government document. My tax dollars paid for it. Americans had the right to the information. And, it wasn't like it had the details of CIA torture or NSA wiretapping. I mean, you know, who could object? But, you know, if, if it's, and it's interesting because I tried to get the inf information and told it wasn't exist. But this, this goes back to the, to the basic rule in DC. It, and that is, if government officials lie to you, it's public service. If you lie to them, it's a felony. And keep that in mind when the FBI knocks on your door. So, um, you know, it was, this is a fun topic, and there's a lot of other outrages and scandals which I could hammer, but I mean, I hate to exhaust people here. Um, a, a couple general themes here. Most, uh, um, on, the, uh, on why things don't get better, one reason is most government cover ups succeed. You know, I've worked as an investigative journalist off and on for decades. Sometimes I can find good information, sometimes not. I often know that, okay, you know, I, I've hardly even seen the, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and there's, you know, the uh, politicians and uh, some of the, you know, mainstream editorial pa papers like to assure people that the truth will out. Well, my attitude is that's BS. Most of the time it doesn't. Or, I mean, think of, the, think of the Warren Commission. The Warren Commission appointed uh, 
by Lyndon Johnson, uh, was supposed to find the truth on the Kennedy assassination. And so they rushed the report. It came out before the 1964 um, presidential election. And it, it had a little caveat. It said, well, you know, we found a lot of other stuff, but we, but we aren't going to release it until 75 years from now. And the government tells you to trust it 75 years from now. I mean, a person would be a fool to trust it. Um, one of, the, one of the frustrating things is to see how quickly people forget, even people who are supposed to be intelligent. Um, and I was, you know, there was a, there was a, um, there was a big uh, one-year anniversary for the Pussy Hat March in D.C. back in January that had a huge rally on the day after Trump's inauguration. They had a smaller rally uh, on January 20th or 21st. Uh, two months ago. I went down to photograph that and talk to some of the people. And it was interesting. You had a number of, I guess, super liberal women there wearing these uh, hockey shirts or whatever saying it's, uh, it's time for uh, Mueller, for the, the former FBI chief special counsel. And they were holding up signs, Mueller is going to save us and all this stuff. And, you know, and they were, they were, they were planning, the, uh, the, the women did a, a, a little march to show how upset they were with Trump and all that stuff. And they're carrying their pro-FBI stuff. And I was thinking, you know, it's really too bad that the march route did not go past the Martin Luther King statue. Because the FBI had vilified and tried to drive Martin Luther King to death, to suicide. And it was horrendous, horrendous what the FBI COINTELPRO Co did to the uh, a black, a black activists not just Martin Luther King, uh, they, uh, they also targeted the anti-war people, leftists, a lot of other groups. The FBI had a reign of terror as far as American civil liberties. But all it takes for a lot of liberals and a lot of the media, New York, a lot of the New York Times coverage, for instance, to forget everything is to have Donald Trump as president and have the, have this, have the FBI as a great hope for toppling him. And it's like, OK, why would you put all your chips on an agency that has a horrendous record? Just horrendous. And that was something that conservatives understood for a while under Obama. Uh, liberals understood when uh, Ronald Reagan was president, when Nixon was president. But it's like it's push button amnesia. And people forget, well, OK, it's, you know, it's almost like the, the only thing it takes for people to forget everything that they ever knew, and that's a lot of them that they don't know much, is to have a shift in uh, who's on your side. But, you know, nothing has happened since 9-11 to make the government more trustworthy. And it's frustrating to see so many lessons that should have been learned forever quickly forgotten. Um, I mean, it, it's interesting to think how the, how the lines of politics in this country would be different if Hillary Clinton had won in November 2016. Um, worse in a lot of ways, better in a few, but uh, there would be a whole different set of lessons that people would be waving in the air. But it's, it's, it's hard to have a lot of faith in the survival of democracy when so many people have got uh, attention deficits or else are just utterly, um, if you have so many people acting as knuckle-headed as TSA agents. And it's almost impossible to overstate how knuckleheaded that is because you got an agency, agency that's done it that's been systematic for making mistakes and perpetuating getting larger budgets. Um, there's, there's a lot of other details, a lot of other horror stories. I don't want to exhaust people. There is there was a wonderful line from H.L. Mencken I read that made a big impression on me. And he said that one horse laugh is worth 10,000 syllogisms. As far as waking people up to the danger of government and to the absurdity of government. And it's so important to take government off that pedestal. And most people don't realize how much of a pedestal they have government on. But if you can say something or write something that causes that flash in their mind, that may start them on the road to freedom. So at this point, I'll draw the curtain of mercy and go to questions. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.